virtual care is new to us and can't wait to find out what these experts have to say. Welcome everybody. Good morning to everyone east of Thunder Bay and good morning to the west. Welcome to the first day of Canadian Patient Safety Week. This year has been momentous in so many ways for so many people. We, we are glad to be able to be here with you today. The only way we can invite all of us together right now is online, where we conduct so much of our business, our personal time, our streaming. Today, we will talk about how our health care is moving into this environment by asking, what does ideal virtual care look like? Thanks to our sponsors, Gojo Industries and Health Pro Procurement Services. My name is Christopher Thrall. I am both a communications officer with and the smooth, silky voice of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. I would like to welcome you on behalf of our technical host, Barb Lafort, and the mastermind behind Canadian Patient Safety Week, Dan Costigan from CPSI. I am joining from Edmonton within Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. Think about the traditional territory on which you stand. I invite you to recognize all First Peoples who are here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As First Peoples have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the cultures, ceremonies, and traditions all all at home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Thank you. So virtual care is new to us. That's the theme for this year's Canadian Patient Safety Week and the truth that least for me. However, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a tremendous increase in virtual care, including telephone visits, online healthcare appoint apps, and text messages between patients and care providers. In the past few months, more than half of Canadian adults who needed advice from a doctor connected with them virtually. Going forward, more than a third of us will choose virtual care as the first way we seek a doctor's advice. Virtual care is here to stay. Today, we will invite three people with special perspectives on virtual care to explore the challenges, opportunities, and future of virtual care in Canada. We will ask the real question, what does ideal virtual care look like? Please write any questions in the Q&A box on your screen or chat them directly to me, Christopher Thrall. They will be compiled and provided to our speakers at the appropriate time. If you run into IT difficulties, please connect with us in the chat box and we would be happy to assist. If you miss part of this webinar or want to share your learnings with others in your team or organization, please know that it's being recorded and will be available on our website within the next week. There will also be a quick survey sent to you after the webinar. Anyway, you didn't log in today to hear from me, so why don't we get started? I promised you three phenomenal speakers today, so please allow me to introduce them. I believe the term multiple hats was coined for our first guest. Dr. Sasha Badia is not only the FM Hill Chair in Health Systems Solutions, Chief Medical Innovation Officer and Division Head of Cardiology at Women's College Hospital in Toronto, but also a scientist at the Institute for, for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and an Associate Professor at the University of Toronto. I got tired just reading all of that. Welcome, Dr. Badia. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, happy to be here. Beautiful. So, Sarah, why don't you hit me? What are your opinions about virtual care? Well, I, I think, um, you know, Chris, Hurd, like, I think we've sort of seen uh, what's happened uh, during the COVID pandemic uh, has sort of validated many of the original, in, um, you know, thoughts that virtual care might be a great way for uh, patients to be able to access uh, care. Uh, from, uh, you know, from their healthcare provider, you know, and part of the, you know, the, I think the, um, the interest now, uh, you know, because people often said, well, this has been uh, around for a long time. So what's happened in the last little while? And, and what I would say to people is, you know, prior to the pandemic, there was this notion that the costs, there's always a cost of, uh, you know, seeing a person in person, what we, what I would call the cost of in-person contact. But that cost, you know, prior to the pandemic was predominantly borne by patients themselves. 
So as an example, you know, if you're a, a young mom and you've got to go see your family doctor, you know, probably you're working, you have to find childcare for your kids. You have to take time off of work. You have to travel. You have to pay for parking, which in downtown Toronto where I am is pretty expensive. And, and you have to wait, you know, to see your doctor for, you know, 15 minutes or however long it is. Um, the healthcare system bore none of the costs pre-pandemic. In the post-pandemic world or in the, you know, in the COVID pandemic, what's changed is the, the risk cost equation is now um, borne also by the health system. So every time I bring a person into my clinic, I have to think like, what's the risk that they may pose if they have COVID to other patients? What are the risks that they're going to pose to um, other providers? And not just doctors and nurses, by the way, actually our front desk staff, uh, you know, the people who are working you know, in as screeners, uh, you know, uh, in our lobbies to like folks, uh, you know, who work in the food court, you know, there's a bunch of folks that ultimately could get sick, uh, our cleaning staff. And then, you know, we have to prep, prep PPE and we have to, we have to conserve it. So, you know, if we have everybody coming in, then we start to dwindle our PPE. And then we also then have to make choices about the capacity of our inpatient care. We can't see as many people now because we can't crowd our waiting rooms. So now the healthcare system has to say, wait a second, we have to think thoughtfully about who we bring in and we don't because the costs are high. And so now that that cost of contact has started to balance out a bit, virtual care becomes much more potent, uh, a tool uh, to be able to get people the care that they need, particularly those with chronic diseases, while at the same time protecting uh, our providers and other patients. Wow, magnificent. That, I hadn't thought about the shared risks that had spiked during the pandemic, but that suggests that the healthcare system responds to costs on it primarily. I'm not saying that's the case, but it might be a suggestion we could explore a little bit later. Thank you so much, Sasha. Our next guest is the executive director of Greg's Wings Projects. For those of you unfamiliar, this is a not-for-profit organization created to honor Greg Price and his ultimately fatal journey through the healthcare system. She is a member of several strategic healthcare groups, a Medal of Honor recipient from the Alberta Medical Association and Greg's sister. May I introduce Ms. Terry Price? Thank you so much for joining us, Terry. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Fantastic. I was just wondering, so maybe step back, maybe from a system perspective, what do you see as the opportunities for virtual care? Yeah, well, um, part of my role with Greg, with Greg's Wings Projects has been sharing a short film that's called Falling Through the Cracks. And so over the last few years, we've been sharing the film, which sparks a lot of discussion about the healthcare system in general. Um, and we've really, and we've, I've literally done screenings in person in every province in Canada, plus the Northwest Terrorism and the Yukon. So have been really grateful to be part of lots of discussions about what needs to change in healthcare. And I think um, virtual care, especially when you're thinking of the broad definition of virtual care, um, I think there's a huge opportunity to use it as an enabler to really change parts of the system and to, to create a foundation that can be more patient partnered, more um, team based, and really, I think virtual care actually makes it easier to do some of those things that we want to see from the healthcare system as a whole, um, because because it it drops some of those barriers and and decreases some of those risks, because um, access can be easier, um, and and even being able to collaborate across teams. If you don't have to physically all be in the same location, then then um, that makes it actually possible to do in a lot of cases where you wouldn't necessarily be able to do that. I love this. This is fantastic. I'm I'm taking down furious notes while you're speaking. This is creating great engagement, collaboration. I love this idea. By the way, I have seen the film, and it is so impactful. Uh, virtual screenings so valuable for sharing this information. Thanks so much, Terry. And finally. Allow me to introduce our last speaker. Now, I don't like to use the word celebrity on our podcast because, or our webinars, because mainly we don't get them often. But in our world, the president of the Canadian Medical Association ranks right up there. Dr. Ann Collins has run a full-time family practice, nursing home care, and residency education for nearly her entire career. 
balanced with tremendous governance work through the New Brunswick Medical Society and the CMA. Today, she's here to speak to us about virtual care. Thank you so much for making the time, Dr. Collins, and welcome. Thank you. Very happy to be here. <laughs> Fantastic. And so how do you see virtual care evolving within the Canadian healthcare system? Well, I think, first of all, it's it's pretty clear that it is certainly here to stay. Um, as my 88-year-old um, mother said um, just after her first uh, virtual care visit uh, with her family physician uh, was, you know, that was that was fantastic. Um, and I would note that she lives about um, 60 kilometers away from her care provider. Um, for the CMA, uh, our focus is on making sure that there's, uh, as this moves forward, that there's a coordinated and consistent approach put in place across the country when it comes to virtual care policy and governance. We're a policy organization. Uh, earlier this year, as part of a task force uh, with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons, as well as the College of Family Practice of Canada, we re released a report with um, that had 19 legislative and policy changes needed to scale up virtual care across the country. Because, of course, that's where this, this has to go. It, it turned on a dime with the uh, advent of, of the pandemic. But we need to broaden um, out its capacity and capabilities. So we, we uh, the report specifically looked at things like interoperability and governance, including a de and developing a set of national standards for patient health information access. Uh, licensure is uh, is a big issue. Quality of care, payment models, uh, and medical education. And so we're continuing to work with governments and those stakeholders to put this roadmap in place. I love it. The consistent application across the country is so important. And here's hoping we can deliver on that. Nineteen policies. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Well, thank you all again for being here. Uh, I remind all of our listeners that you can carry on conversations in the chat window or send your specific questions to me and we will ask our speakers later on in the webinar. I would like to kick off our discussion with a bit of a touchy subject, though. Most of you seem to be pretty positive about the idea of virtual care, but I have my doubts. I'm worried about those who are excluded, seniors, the undereducated with low digital literacy. I'm worried about people who can't access virtual services doing uh, virtual services due to being too remote, too rural, low income. I'm worried about cultural and language barriers, which are poorly addressed by virtual care. In short, what about access? What about equity? Tell me about how virtual care can manage these issues. And how about we start with you? Well, as we've said, this shift is incredibly promising. Um, and as you've pointed out, Chris, there, these are issues that, that the pandemic has in and of itself raised about our, our uh, marginalized or vulnerable populations. So that, um, for instance, one of the things that we have been targetly advocating for is um, increased access to broadband internet which is so vitally important to our rural, uh, remote, and Indigenous communities. And we are pleased to see that the federal government has announced some funding to connect several hundred thousand homes and businesses in, in this area. Uh, and we also talk about having, you know, an increased um, digital um, knowledge amongst Canadians that is something that that has to be uh, provided as well, and that any tools that are developed to enhance virtual care um, be easily applicable to uh, to smartphones, for example. Um, but yes, we do recognize uh, that there are populations where there will need to be targeted efforts made to in enhance and to make their access equitable. So th these are part of the 19 policies, the, pa the paper that you're putting forward, the advice that you're giving the governments in order to integrate these concerns as we go forward. Have you seen any progress along these lines? 
Well, I think so. I think in seeing that the government has made that commitment to broadband yeah, access, yeah, for sure. yeah, I think that's we take that as a very positive. We have to remember, as as previous panelists said, that virtual care has been around for a long time, but really not in the capacity and with the usage that we've seen um, since March, really. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I'm going to turn to another speaker. I'm going to actually invite Terry to speak on the same subject. But while I do, would you be able to look up that paper or maybe provide a link in our chat window? I think there's interest in finding out more about that white paper, that policy request. I'll come back to you in just a few minutes. Thank you so much, Anne. Terry, how about yourself? Tell me about equity. Tell, tell me about access. Um, I think it's a really important part of the conversation. And I've been. Um, happy to hear that it comes up in the conversation most of the time when we're talking about virtual care that it's not um it's not being ignored um i think we intentionally need to have conversations with um the different groups that are are experiencing these challenges and to try and come up with solutions with them on how to overcome it i don't think that it should be a reason not to do virtual care. I think it needs to be something that um, that we can constantly are looking at. Um, and I, I mean, I think to sort of go to the the title of the the whole session in an ideal system, it would be that learning system that really does um, get feedback and constantly is trying is evolving and and learning from all of the different groups to try and make sure that we're optimizing the system that we have for everyone, because it, can, it won't be an ideal system if we're leaving people behind. No. It won't be. And there's, there's some, some cultural things that need to be addressed. And there's some sort of um, the, the, I don't know what the right term would be, but like access to broadband, that physical actual need for addressing um, and access to broadband, I think is critical for health and virtual care. It's critical for, critical for a whole bunch of things. So um, it, I think the government should be prioritizing that because I can't imagine having kids at home right now um, trying yeah. to work through and, and not having access to internet. It's, it, we don't wanna leave people behind because of something like that. I hear you. I hear you. And I know that you have been involved in some of the engagement activities and some of the access uh, questions. So I'm going to go to Sasha for just a second. But if you could think about some of the ideas that you might propose for reaching out to some of those target audiences, some of those groups, and how we might be able to integrate some of their voices, I'd love to hear a little bit of sort of, these are the list of the menu of requirements. So think, think about that. I'm just going to go to Sasha for a second. Dr. Bauer, Nadia, what do you think? Tell me about equity and access, uh, you as uh, getting direct experience with this. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I think it is, uh, and I think there's some comments in the chat that I agree with. Um, there's a lot of assumptions about what, about access and equity and virtual care that I'm not sure are necessarily borne out by data. And so vir the way I think about it, virtual care is just about, is really care. And it's about service delivery. And sometimes, uh, these things can exacerbate, depending on how you design the service, can exacerbate inequities. So, for example, you know, if you have a technology that is only allows you to access service if you speak English, that can, uh, for example, uh, you know, disenfranchise those uh, folks who are bilingual or are, you know, uh, whose English is not their first language. So that is, that's for sure. But one, there is assumptions that uh, older patients don't use technology, which I think is actually, there's data that demonstrates that the fastest users of uh, and adopters of technology now are folks over the age of 65. So I think that, I think we have to examine that a little bit further. The second is around the issue of those that are in, you know, say for example, vulnerable populations, rural, northern, and potentially in neighborhoods with a lower socioeconomic income. Here's the thing, like for many of them, they don't have the luxury to take time, take a few hours off work and potentially travel, you know, hours uh, as, it, as it is the case up north to see their primary care provider. So virtual care may actually narrow the gap. And, and the other thing that I would say is the way we think of virtual care at women's is not actually a technology focused thing. It really is about really, um, delivering care 
across time and space that is facilitated by technology. That technology could be something as simple as the telephone. So, you know, the telephone is a great little ubiquitous tool that everybody has access to that doesn't require broadband, that bluntly speaking, you know, you can uh, do a phone call and I've had patients do their phone call in their car. I've had them do it while they're doing childcare pickup. I've had them like, you know, do it in all kinds of places. And the truth is, is that it might even be more convenient and more patient centered for them so that they don't actually have to disrupt their day. I'm bringing the care to them. So I think there are real questions about how we deliver virtual care. I, there's no question. But I think before we put out assumptions that it's automatically going to disenfranchise people, I think we need to ask them. We need to like look at it in a bit more care. And we need to make sure that when we design these services, we design them with the end user, AKA the patient and caregiver in mind. Yeah, and I, and I love that that redefinition of virtual care as being just one of the avenues, one of the media that we use for the circle of care that's already in existence. But I want to push back with you, uh, push back on you on that, Sasha, because we are saying that yes, it is a tool we can use to access, but that doesn't address equity. That doesn't address the cultural problems that I have speaking to you in in the doctor's office in the room. I can't express myself very well. My language isn't very good. My accent's poor. I don't understand what you're saying very well. How is that addressed, exacerbated, or 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 resolved on in virtual in the virtual world? It's a great question, and it requires study. And I think Anne mm -hmm. had mentioned even before that one of the issues we have to do is think about medical education. Um, but again, technology is in many cases is is uh, can be culturally agnostic. It's a tool. The way I think about it is these are just tools. It mm -hmm. depends on what you imbue into that tool. So if you have your own biases, if you decide, well, I'm going to conduct a virtual visit the exact same way that I conduct my office visit, and I'm going to basically spend five minutes with the patient and move on to something else, then yeah, you're right. That's, you know, it's, it's not going to work. But on the other hand, you know, you can actually do a lot with technology. You can have translate lines. You can actually three-way call somebody in. You can do a Zoom chat where you bring in different folks who can actually help to, uh, you know, uh, reduce uh, language barriers, can help translate, can also bring in family members who may not be able to come into hospital. So you're actually doing a lot. So I just think, you know, we should be careful when we say, well, by definition, the current system that we have is equitable and anything new <laughs> is inequitable. In fact, we need to actually go to go take it back to the studs, so to speak, and say, what are we doing? Is this in the best interest of patients? And let's take this opportunity to design systems and tools that will actually uh, achieve the goals that we want. Absolutely. And believe me, I'm not saying that the current system is equitable. I'm just trying to see if virtual care will be better or worse for them. And we just don't know yet. So why don't we turn back to Terry and I'm just going to find out, do you have something for me, some way we can try and integrate some of these groups into decision making models? What do you think, Terry? Um, I wish I had a simple, this is exactly <laughs> what we need to do. And I think mm -hmm. if that, um, if that answer was that easy, then we'd be in a different place right now. It's, it is a challenging question and it's, it's not necessarily easy to, to really, um, because it, it can't be that check the box kind of exercise where we bring one person in on the committee and, and to represent the entire yeah, community yes. or right. whatever. <laughs> right. So, um, I think. Acknowledging and making sure that that we are having those conversations and actually listening to to the to the information and the experience that is shared and the ideas um, that are shared by patients and their family members and um, really anybody that's interacting with the system to really try and continuously improve the system um, and making sure that you are truly partnering that it's not. It's that you're bringing in diverse voices. You are actually talking to the different populations that that are experiencing um, any of the challenges or experiencing it in an optimal way so that we can learn from the groups that are doing it really well. And one of the things that we always liked, we always really believe is um, needed as a foundation for healthcare is the really strong teamwork mindset. And um, 
and that teams may need to be inviting in different um, members of the team that may not be what you would traditionally think of, but that maybe it's somebody that can help with those cultural barriers and or translation or helping somebody figure out the technology that's not necessarily what you would automatically think of as being a member of the care team, but can actually help significantly to facilitate um, that optimal care interaction um, for everybody that it's, yeah. it's actually yeah. beneficial. And yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll stop there. For yeah, now. please don't no, thank <laughs> you seem to be on the same page as Dr. Badia, though. It's just a matter of making sure that the end user, the patient is really integrated into any decisions we make along these lines. So thank you very much, Terry. And did you have anything to add for that? I noticed you shared the CMA report. So I thank you very much for that. Anything else you'd like to add? <laughs> No, I think that it's it's important um, that each each context uh, will have its own uh, needs. Um, a, a longstanding family physician uh, like myself, with a, a a group of patients that have been there for thirty years, the, the provision of virtual care as a tool, because it's not going to replace, nor should it replace. Um, uh, person to person visits, it, it can't in certain situations. Um, it will have um, one set of procedures, if you will, as, as opposed to uh, where a hospital team is providing or a hospital clinic is providing that care uh, or even a community based clinic. So there has to be flexibility. I fully agree uh, that that we have to have the patient voice in whatever is going to be developed, um, whether it be at a national level or even within provinces, whatever jurisdiction, um, patient voice certainly needs to be there. Great. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Anne. Uh, we're going to move on to the second question that we have here because uh, I, I, as much as I love the equity and, and access, uh, my chat window blew up with people talking about the issue. So let's try something else which is of particular interest uh, to us here at the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Um, how has virtual care impacted patient safety in terms of challenges or opportunities? Terry, why don't we start with you? Um, I mean, I think, I don't, I wouldn't, <laughs> I always struggle with completely separating virtual care as a completely independent thing in the healthcare system compared to the rest of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, I, we have a long way to go to having, um, to being able to say we have a safe healthcare system. We know that, um, that um, harm is um, the third leading cause of death. And so we, there, there's lots of progress that needs to be made in, for safe care across the board. I think virtual care, I mean, right now during the pandemic, the option of virtual care has decreased that risk of exposure to, to COVID. And so there are mm -hmm. situations where it is safer to provide virtual care, but we have to make sure that when care is provided, any care, including virtual care, that, that those dimensions of safety and quality are are included in in those decisions that it's it's not that we just completely flip and and provide only virtual care like Anne said there's there's going to be times where in person is required um, and it's I think what I'm excited about and where I see the opportunity is that blend where mm -hmm. where virtual care is used when it makes sense when it can be more convenient it's um, all of the things that Sasha talked about that are are um, making it better for the patients that the, the load is lifted off of the patients um, for those appointments where it's more sharing of information or checking in or it's something that that virtual care um, makes sense and and we tend to default to when we're talking about virtual care the the video appointment or a telephone call and really um, virtual care I think the real opportunity is is all of the tools that are potentially available, including sort of asynchronous secure messaging and all of those things, because that's where the real opportunity is, is being able to really embed all of those different tools into um, enabling ideally teams to care for patients, especially when they've been diagnosed with something significant or they have complex needs that require multiple people to be, to be part of that team. 
um, that I think there's huge opportunity with virtual care to be safer because you're not not relying on that one 15 minute appointment with one person um, to, to, to address all of the needs that the patient has. I love that. I love that it's an it, it's an expanded circle of care. So I I really like that. And I do want to touch on something that both you and Anne have mentioned. Uh, the Canadian Patient Safety Week also features a number of tools that you can use either as a healthcare provider or as a patient to differentiate between when virtual care might be a better way to reach out versus going on in and seeing somebody in person. So if you visit uh, to all of our listeners, if you visit PatientSafetyWeek.ca and ConquerSilence.ca, you'll see some of those tools. That you can use to sort of navigate your way through that first step. But now I want to turn to Sasha. Sasha, how about yourself? Uh, patient safety and virtual care, uh, threats, opportunities? I mean, I think uh, in general, I would say um, we're at the so-called virtual care 1.0 phase, right? Like we figured out the adoption, thing, okay? Like so doctors are using it now, hallelujah. But we have to figure out like the right mix here. You know, so like as an example, right now in Ontario, they fund, you know, virtual care is funded, basically it's synchronous. And I love that Terry brought up asynchronous because I actually agree wholeheartedly that asynchronous is really where we're going to get some of the major gains in capacity. But it, a lot of it depends on, you know, uh, you know, how you use it. Again, these are, I'll say the same thing. These are just tools. Right. So like one of the things is that, um, you know, a we have to decide, you know, when is a in-person visit appropriate? When is a video visit necessary? When should you do a phone call? And then when can you just respond to people via email and what types of scenarios clinically go with each type of visit? Like as an example, I had a patient in clinic who I think probably needs to get his aortic valve replaced, but I'm not going to make that call over the phone, right? We're going to, I said, we need to bring you into hospital. I need to see you in person and we need to have a conversation with your family. That's got to be an in-person conversation. On the other hand, you know, there's a lot of conversations as Terry probably had mentioned that, you know, we could just do over email with somebody that I have a relationship with and they have a question you know, like say I say we have a they go to their family doctor and they get a medication that actually is, I think, problematic. A lot of patients will be like, just so you know, I went to my family doctor, they ordered this. What do you think about this as a tech, as a as a as a message through our patient portal? And I can actually have that information and I can go, oh, wait, I I actually think you shouldn't have that or I actually think you should try something else or I can then call the family doctor. Before all of this, I wasn't getting any of that. I would wait until I got a note six months later or my next visit with the patient to then find out that they've been on a medication. I didn't want them on for a six month period of time. So there, there, the point is, is that of course there can be challenges around any service delivery can lead to potential gaps in patient safety. But if we do this well, there also is an opportunity where we can close that, narrow that gap, and actually make the system safer. It's, it's not the technology. It's about how we develop, develop, develop and deliver the services. Yeah, and, and I, I love that perspective. I really do, Sasha. And I, I like, I admire the personal responsibility that you are taking for virtual care rather than sort of making it systemic. Okay, the system has to be sure that we're doing the absolute best for, for the patient which is absolutely essential, but I like you're also taking responsibility for your responsibility for the patient as well. So both of those things have to be in place in virtual care. Thank you very much, Sasha. And what can you tell us about patient safety, that not only necessarily with your policy recommendations, but even as a practitioner, how does patient safety factor into virtual care, threats and opportunities? Well, I think really uh, what we're all talking about here, uh, maybe in non-specific way, is about um, health information sharing. Um, and I think uh, that virtual care perhaps is um, is sort of uncovering some of the, or exacerbating, bringing to the forefront some of the uh, cracks that we already know exist in that. And uh, I'm, I'm reminded about that with Sasha's um, um, story or uh, 
possible scenario about um, a, a prescribing inappropriateness or an inappropriate drug, perhaps. But if if everybody in the circle of care doesn't have that information, um, that pre presents a safety risk to the patient. And and if the onus is put on the patient to uh, to bring that to everybody's attention, that's that's a huge ask to make of someone. Um, so. Safety uh, in virtual care is affected in many ways by the same things that affect patients in the pre-COVID, pre-virtual care world. And it speaks to the need to have um, interoperability between different parts of the care team, whether it be the pharmacist, the family doctor, the specialist, the physiotherapist. Um, and there's kind of a void in that space right now, who is going to bring all of those uh, players together? Because there has to be, um, as Terry said, there has to be conversations. There have to be relationships developed here, not just in the the actual patient care, but in the developing the policy and the and the operability around how all how all of this um, is is going to tie together. And another thing I'll just highlight a little bit about is is privacy. Sometimes um, privacy can get in. Privacy is a good thing. We all respect it. Confidentiality is the cornerstone of the doctor uh, patient relationship. But sometimes within the circle of care, it can get in the way um, and, and it can actually work counter productively to the way that virtual care can enhance uh, care and, and make care and connections happen more quickly. So we still have, uh, I like Sasha's, you know, virtual care 1.0, absolutely. There's still a lot of uh, work and development that needs to go on here. And, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm loving the, the conversation and this, this possible integrated and national uh, health care system. I'm a little worried about the individual cogs within the individual practitioners, the individual providers uh, drinking from the fire hose of information that they might be uh, exposed to, but also the protection of privacy. We have to integrate that concept, the, the freedom of information, protection of privacy and healthcare information. It should be, should be sacred, should be private. But I'm gonna push back a little bit because you were mentioning that yet, I agree with you, it shouldn't be entirely on the patient's head to keep all of this information in mind and be the only sole link sort of thing. But I do think they have a role. And at the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, we encourage patients to ask questions. We encourage you to keep a medication list and bring that to every appointment, everything like that. Uh, Terry, are there any other things that you would maybe recommend to a patient sort of wandering into the virtual care environment to sort of keep themselves safer? Can we, can we have a little chat about that before we move on to questions from our participants? Sure, um, I think, and I think there has been, that's one of the things that we've seen in the last six months is some sort of checklists and guides and all of those things for helping um, patients have safe interactions. Again, it's focusing on the, the appointment, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whether it's on the phone or video conference, it's, there is sort of, in order to be prepared, and I would assume um, that lots of like um, when you're when you're when you have an appointment with a family physician or any um, healthcare professional, that they're probably sending out some of those in advance as well. And so it does help to prepare. Right. I think um, some uh, some of the comments around the flow of information, like again, if you're if we're talking about ideal system that it shouldn't be that the patient hat is like in a lot of situations right now, it's not the same across the whole country, but um, the patient is the most, is the only consistent member of the team. Mm -hmm. And so they end up with the most information or the potential to have the most information and the responsibility for sharing does lie on their shoulders. Whereas and it should an be listened system, to as well. That, right, exactly, yeah. for sure. Um, but in an ideal system, that care team would have access to that information. If, if anybody's making a decision on care, whether it's virtually or in person, that we need access to all of the decision or the information in order to make safe decisions. And so I think that too is an essential piece of that ideal system is, is the flow of information um, to make sure that, that the members of the care team can provide it. So right now, patients, 
in a lot of scenarios, lots of patients that we've interacted with, um, they're carrying around binders or have the, all yeah. of their files on a USB or something like they're doing things um, to overcome some of the barriers that exist in the system for the flow of information because they recognize it's important. I think in, in a lot of cases it is required. Um, ideally, we can move beyond that. And if we have that recognition of how critically important information is, that we can push the system into a place where, and, and maybe virtual care and the uptake on virtual care will help also push that because I can imagine it being really challenging to, to feel confident in the, in the care that you're providing virtually if you don't have access to the information. And so maybe some of that progress will go hand in hand. I hope so. I hope so. We uh, at the Canadian Safety Institute with Canadian Patient Safety Week, we have uh, offered some of these resources available to patients. So any healthcare providers or patients, please visit conquersilence.ca. There are a number of different resources to download there, including how to prepare yourself for a virtual appointment, different questions you can ask, etc. So thank you so much, Terry. Um, like I said, the 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 question uh, area has been blowing up. So thank you, Sasha, Ann, and Terry. We've been receiving all these questions from the chat, so I figured we could open ourselves up to the listeners. So my first one, you know what? I'm gonna go to Sasha for this one first off. Um, how do we evaluate virtual care? <laughs> we have family practices with different funding models across the country. Tell me how we evaluate virtual care. Sure. So um, it's a good question, and it, you know, we—I don't have an hour, so we're just going to do no. it real quick. Um, again, virtual care is care. Okay. Uh, you know, I think you know we've often taken IT uh, in health and tried to evaluate it based on IT-related metrics, mm -hmm. like number of clicks, number of computers, number of people using it. And honestly, I think now we have to really think about this. Like, I, you know, in a year or two from now, I hope that we just call virtual care care. And it's like banking. You don't say online banking versus like banking at a branch versus banking at an ATM. It's just banking. And okay. in that case, what you're evaluating it on is, the, is quite sim simply the same things that you evaluate other care on. And so we use the, tr the quadruple aim, uh, the IHI's quadruple aim. So you know, any health intervention or any type of care should improve population health, should like improve the patient experience, provider experience, and hopefully not add unnecessary costs or excessive costs into the system. There's a variety of ways that you can do that. I think one of the things that I think, uh, you know, we've been talking to Kai Hyer, the Canadian Institute of Health Information, about using, you know, billing data now that there are enabled billing codes. Mm -hmm. You start to use administrative data to also look at patterns of care. But I think that we need to also be thinking about, we now have all this technology that's going to patients. Let's start collecting data. So like, you know, like think about what Amazon does or all these, uh, you know, anytime you order from Uber Eats, what do you get? You get a survey. How was your order? There's <laughs> opportunities for patients to provide feedback. How was your virtual care care today? Yeah. No, I love it. Today? A star yep. rating. So there are yeah. <laughs> ways that we can start to collect some of this information and we can use it, uh, you know, in simple and effective ways to remodel the way that we're delivering care. So I, I think it. we should look at other industries who have been doing this <laughs> for a long time as ways, as potential models in this case. I love it. And so tell, tell me about evaluation from your side. And if you can link me up, do you know of any studies that are in progress for evaluating virtual care versus in-person care or even just during the pandemic? Tell me about evaluation. Yeah, so I, I don't know of any studies, Chris. So I'll be okay. upfront right off the bat about that. But I think to uh, just to add on what Sasha has said, which is extremely detailed, is is outcomes as well. Is that we we will have to have some way of measure, and I have no doubt that studies will be undertaken to um, to look at you know pick something, pick a, a certain medical condition or um, something that's led to a procedure, wait times, that type of thing. So I, I think it'll be a, a complex multi 
um, uh, multifactorial process that will look at many things to to evaluate it. Um, and, and it has to be done. I mean, it should be done in what in how we're providing care now as well, um, really. So, but I think outcome is is critically important. I love that, and and it's just, I really love how we're sort of coming around to the point where virtual care. We just like Sasha said, drop the virtual off it. It's all care. So that that's brilliant, uh, Terry. I I think you're going to agree in terms of outcomes uh, being evaluated just in terms of care. Let's switch you over a little bit and just ask, how does virtual care contribute to the overall level of quality of care? Can you explore that for me? Um, I think so. <laughs> yeah. um, I, the level of quality, I mean, quali the definition yeah, of quality. Define quality, quality how's that, uh, yes, please. Yeah. <laughs> There's there's a lot of things that can go into defining quality. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to come up with all of them off the top of my head, but like acceptability, which would talk to some of the the um, cultural factors potentially that mm -hmm. we talked about before. Um, accessibility, which virtual care if, and my family lives an hour outside of the city. Um, and so we're, we're not that like I didn't grow up rural remote, but we do grow. I grew up in a town that doesn't have a doctor. Um, and so, so being able to connect, I think virtual care on the accessibility has potential there. There, there's a lot of different um, components to true quality that I think um, virtual care. Again, I do. I also would like to drop the the virtual term off of, um, off of, and just to sort of touch on the last question a little bit. Too, I think um, in the stage that we're in right now. Lots of people are pretty forgiving about virtual care not being perfect. It's a lot of people are interacting with virtual care for the first time. They, they're the expectation is that it's like they're sort of they need it for some specific reason. I don't think there's extremely high expectations for it to be. Um, and from what I've seen, satisfaction about virtual care interactions has been high, um, which is positive. And to to build on the um, how do we measure it? I think those and some of the examples that Sasha gave that are sort of that consumer model of getting feedback and constantly um, improving. I think we also need to have that mindset shift on on um, feedback from patients not necessarily being complaining that that when if we have an experience that's not exactly perfect, that we can speak up and share share that to improve the quality of the system as a whole. I mean, it's probably feedback quite often would be more narrow, but it's like specific to that appointment. Absolutely. But that, that loop and that approach of recognizing it's not going to be perfect the first time that we're rolling it out, we're aiming for something that can be significantly better across the board. And speaking up and providing feedback on what worked and what didn't is an essential part of being able to get there. And I, so really listening to patients and and frontline staff and everybody on the care team to really recognize um, how we're all interacting with new systems and and ideally having the tools that are designed also embracing that need for change and and making sure that the tools that are designed are evolving and improving as we go too, which should hopefully all continually improve the quality of the interactions and the care that's being provided. I love that. Just feedback, evaluations, uh, going into actually improving the care. So important, so important to uh, ongoing because we're not going to come out of the out of the hot perfect. So, uh, Sasha, I have one more quick question. I'm giving you two minutes to answer it because we're going to get to the to the real real meaty one right away. But tell me about how we train people differently or better for virtual care. Most most healthcare providers sort of give some sort of education or orientation, I assume. But you tell me what is training like? How do we improve it? Or is it the best it can be? Uh, you know what? It is a work in progress. Yeah. So um, I would say, you know, Anne's probably well positioned with the work that CMA is doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously we're at an academic medical center. So you know, there is, uh, you know, we are trying, we have a lot of learners and trainees. So, you know, right now, what happens is for phone or video, uh, the trainee will do the uh, call or the video visit, 
I will let the patient know that I will call them back or God. if they're very senior, I, you know, and they're a follow-up, I, I might just, you know, say they can call the patient back and I'll be in the room, uh, you know, and, uh, and we'll like, we'll talk through the case and all of our cases are obviously reviewed. The challenge is, you know, there's a lot that we just don't know, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like being able to get physical exam data is really obviously challenging. Uh, what are the processes to do that? What are the challenges around reading, you know, the nonverbal cues that we normally do? That's a lot of training. Right. Thinking about ways, I mean, everyone's sort of, uh, you know, figuring this out on the fly. Like I've had people do neurologic examinations using video visits and getting patients to walk. Uh, I've seen people try and do dermatology has been using uh, digital photos. There's all kinds of things that you can do but none of it's really been validated yet. So it's hard to then train the next generation mm -hmm. when the, the docs that are doing it are really learning a lot of it themselves. So I think we're going to really be, this is really interesting because we're kind of building the plane and flying the plane. At the same time. <laughs> yep. um, I've heard that metaphor. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, you know, in, in many ways I learned from my trainees, you know, about mm -hmm. different techniques that they use and we talk about it. So, I, I think this is going to be hard. I, again, I think we need to lean on one thing that I think is great in Canada is we have one of the best set of training programs in the entire world. We train our clinicians, I think, exceptionally well. And so I trust the Royal College and, you know, our colleges to really be able to, you know, kind of think about this. But as I said, it is a work in progress for sure. Yeah. You. Thank you. So Sasha relies on his trainees. So look for Sasha on TikTok coming soon to a computer near you. Uh, we did have a, a comment from one of our attendees saying that there is a study underway, underway in Alberta cancer with administrative patterns of care in person and virtual, sort of exploring patient experience and staff experience, saying that your voice matters. So these are definitely examples of how we're doing this. So um, I do have one final question. I'm going to hand it to you and you can run with it for any direction you want to, but you have two minutes. So Anne, can you tell me what does virtual ideal virtual care look like? Well, I think we've uh, touched on many of the, the points around that. Um, it should be, I think ideally, it should be coordinated with some consistency across the country that there be, uh, you know, a virtual care lexicon um, that uh, you, I just wanted to touch briefly on the education aspect of it, that, that this is something that will and, and will need to be part of the accreditation process mm -hmm. for the 17 um, medical schools who provide training across the country. Uh, ideally, there would be um, interoperability and great connection between all um, members of, of a, uh, a person's health or circle of care, their health care team, um, that there be a, a seamless transfer of information, that the patient would have um, uh, a gratifying and satisfying experience, and that, that the proper care medium would be provided to meet what that problem demands. And so that uh, if, if, if the examination part, because it is still a critical part of medicine, cannot be done well virtually. And remember, we're also gonna see more uh, integration with AI and other modalities here as well. Um, so I think that, and that it be uh, accessible um, uh, to, to Canadians in, in their, language of choice uh, in their medium of choice uh, you know let's swing for the fences on this one here, because here. It's, I love it's, it. it it's it's going to be it, it's here it, it mm -hmm. and uh, and if anything is a silver lining in this pandemic uh, the explosion of virtual care has been it Right on. I like, I like the triage point that you make there. It really has to be the right care at the right time for the right person. So, uh, Sasha, how about you tell me, what does ideal virtual care look like to you? Well, I think ideal virtual care is, is ideal health. So, I think it is, to me, if you think about, um, I, it's a facile example, but I think non-clinicians understand it. So, when you think about banking, right? 
um, there are multiple channels that are um, that that consumers are, are are nudged into, right? So you and you, it almost becomes intuitive. So as an example, I know that if I need to deposit a check to the bank, I can either go to the branch bank and I can wait in line, or I can go to um, ATM, or I can actually now mm -hmm. do it on my phone. And nobody has to tell me which way to do it. I kind of, it becomes intuitive after a while, right? And if I need to like set, pay a bill, I know I can do it on my computer. And I know if I have to take out money, I can put an ATM. The point is, is there are multiple channels so that there isn't just, not everyone rushes to the branch. I think a good, a great virtual care system is really a great care system that is ultimately patient centered and ensures that even if, you know, my doctor isn't available or, you know, um, you know, uh, I can't get in to see my physician within a, short, a window of time. There are other options besides the emergency room that are available to me that I, I can get, that. you know, clear guidance of where I can go to get my questions answered, to get care, uh, you know, managed. And that importantly, and I think Anne mentioned this, there is a flow of information such that you know, all that data is actually being utilized by mm -hmm. the system to actually continuously improve the services that are being provided. So that, you know, one, providers are getting data on their patients in a way that isn't overwhelming, that allows me to make decisions. And the system is also understanding and using data about the way patients interact, the way that, how they're feeling about it, uh, and, you know, about their outcomes so that we can constantly keep adjusting and improving. And when I you start it. to do that, suddenly you've created a safe, patient-centered, and very effective system. See, and I love just the short form. Is great virtual care is great care and patient-centered and continuous improvement. I, these, are the, these are the bullets that we need in virtual care planning. Terry, how about you bring us home? What does ideal virtual care look like? I was really hoping I wouldn't have to go last, but um, <laughs> but I but I put you on the feature <laughs> spot right here. <laughs> no, and I I, I agree with um, Anne and Sasha so far for sure. Um, one thing I would definitely highlight from a patient perspective is that the system needs to be patient partnered, both in the delivery of care, but in the design of the system as well, and yes. and making sure that the voice, the patient voice, it, and diverse voices are represented in a meaningful way. Um, that it's not just the single person sitting on a committee because we're not going to get the right design for the system that meets the needs of everybody by by with that approach. We need to be meeting patients where they they um, need, like getting feedback from them where they are and making sure that we're actually seeking out those diverse perspectives, um, which absolutely. is not an easy thing to do, but it is absolutely essential. Um, and I think I would just, again, um, go back to the, the opportunity to really enable teamwork in, in um, care and that virtual care should make that or the virtual tools for better care um, should make that easier that that work with to be able to um, to collaborate across the team members for with patients for patients um, is is something that will be. Um, part of a part of the system going forward, that that mindset that we need to work together, that we're actually relying on each other as team members to, to provide the best care for patients and that virtual care can help us do that. That it's, Absolutely. it doesn't have to be always one-on-one -on -one in person interactions that the patient and the, we have this conversation a lot because the way, not the way the film depicts Greg's journey really well about it sort of being, okay, he's talking to this person and then there's a gap and then he's talking to this person and then there's a gap and then he's talking to this person. That kind of care isn't ideal care. Being, no. being able to bring um, all of the inform information together and having everybody collaborate on what the best and safest decision is for patients in their care journey is, is hopefully where we're moving. And I think the door, COVID opened the door for more conversation about virtual care and the virtual care tools. And I hope we continue this conversation and continue to push it forward to here, here. a better system.
And I love this concept of integrating the patient voice, not in a prescriptive way, but actually in the planning process of diverse voices all across the world. So thank you so much, Terry. I see that we're at time. We want to respectfully thank Dr. Ann Collins, Ms. Terry Price, and Dr. Sasha Badia for sharing their time and expertise. Thanks to all of you for taking the time to attend. On behalf of me, Christopher Thrall, technical host Barb Lafort, Dan Costigan, and the rest of the team here, please take a moment to respond to the survey that we'll email out to you later. If you want to continue the conversation started in this discussion, please feel free to send us an email. We'll forward your comments and any questions you may have had that were unaddressed onto our speakers. We will also post a recorded copy of this webinar on the CPSI website in the next week or so. Thank you for joining us for the first day of Canadian Patient Safety Week. This year's theme is Virtual Care is New to Us. Make sure you're signed up for notifications about this week's activities at patientsafetyweek.ca, where healthcare providers and leaders can find resources to help you make the most of virtual care visits. There, you can learn about Friday's webinar on the upcoming Canadian Quality and Patient Safety Framework that launches this week. We're also, we also worked with the Canadian Medical Association to create a variety of tools for you to share with patients at conquersilence.ca. While you're there, check out the season four of our award-winning patient podcast series. Watch out for our social media posts and share them with your networks. Thanks to our sponsors, Gojo Industries and Health Pro Procurement Services. Have a wonderful day, everyone. We look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.